Go Inside the Crimson Tide with your hosts Rodney Orr and Gary Harris, keeping you informed on everything Alabama. Tider Insider TV, brought to you by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. And good evening, everybody, and welcome into Tider Insider TV. As mentioned at the top, brought to you by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Alongside Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com, I'm WVUA 23 Sports Director Gary Harris. And remember I told you, once you get into the football season, it flies by. Three games already in the books, Rodney. I mean, it's going by fast. Alabama, in the latest game, beat ULM 63-7 to this past Saturday at Bryant-Denny Stadium. Crimson Tide totaled 262 return yards in the game breaking a 75-year record for punt return yards. Bryce Young, of course, uh, did his thing. Wasn't his best game, but he was sharp early to his good pal, Trayshawn Holden, who put a spin move on the Warhawks defensive back, and he's into the end zone. The Tide uh, on defense now, and this was something that was good to see. Not only was this Alabama's first forced turnover of the year, Will Anderson turns it into a pick six. He gets the touchdown, turning defense into offense. It was his first career interception as a member of Alabama. He, you know, he usually gets the quarterback on the ground. Alabama blocked the punt and returned it for a touchdown. I mean, they were scoring every way that you could score, Rodney. Uh, offense, defense, three special teams or two special teams touchdowns. It was really an outstanding effort. Bryce Young can not only throw it, he can run it. And uh, the spin move there and Bryce kneeling there and uh, – Thanking the good Lord right there before halftime. Uh, Young and Jameer Gibbs. Alabama's got a lot of weapons, Rodney. We'll finish watching these highlights. You're going to see Brian Branch here in a moment on the punt return as you watch Gibbs do his thing. Branch so was filling in for McKinstry. Kool-Aid had done a great job returning punts. Then Brian Branch comes in. What does he do? He goes 68 yards to the house. So, you know what? There was a period there in the second half, the second uh, quarter, where Alabama went for it on fourth down, didn't make it. Bryce had missed a wide-open touchdown throw to Jameer Burton. Monroe scored a touchdown and had a little more momentum offensively. But other than that span, it was total domination by the Crimson Tide. Yeah, it really was. All three phases, as you mentioned there, Gary. And I tell you, some of the finer points we liked were the offensive line. I, I, I thought, I, again, I understand people say, well, it was a lot of Monroe. In the second half, they were ready to quit. But I thought the offensive line with Tyler Booker in at left guard – that was very promising. Yeah, Booker came in and seemed to add some physicality. And uh, Alabama, Rodney, let's be honest, they're going to have to have, I think, a, a more improved running game going forward. I think once you get into conference play, you can't put it all on Bryson. And I'm not talking about just um, – you know, the speed sweeps and getting out on the perimeter. I'm talking about being able to bust it up in there between the tackles and push the line of scrimmage. Side. And I thought we saw some promise of that. I, I thought that, uh, you know, several of the backs looked really good. Jace McClellan, you mentioned Jameer Gibbs. Roy Dell Williams had some real powerful runs, had that great run for the touchdown. Jamarian Miller, the true freshman, looked really good too. Trey Sanders had a touchdown run. So I thought the inside run game looked a lot better. And, again, it's going to be interesting moving forward how they'll handle that left guard spot. J.B. and Cohen was really good last year. He's been in and out of the lineup. Kendall Randolph was back at tight end in this game. So it looks like that perhaps Tyler Booker may get some more action. And speaking of tight end, we saw the talented freshman catch a, a touchdown pass. Yeah, that Amari Nyblack. We've been bragging about him for a long time. Number 84 uh, did a fantastic job. Got open his first reception uh, in his career at Alabama scored. There you see Trayshawn Holden with the touchdown reception. Bryce Young, and let's be honest, the expectation level, I know Coach Saban doesn't like expectations, but they're out there. The expectation for him is he's going to throw for 300 yards every game and, you know, maybe four or five incompletions, no interceptions. He's been good so far this year, and he's doing what it takes to win games. I do think Bryce Young can play a lot better. Absolutely, and I, I think, again, sometimes in these games, Gary, I, I know fans get upset, but I do believe that they're, they're tinkering with things, trying to find where their identity might be, how they want to move forward with that, with personnel. We talked about Tyler Booker. We talked about Amari, Amari Nyblack. There's several young receivers that could continue to get in the mix, so we'll see as they start to move forward. And a final thought on special teams. This is where I think everybody talks about offense and defense, but when you play these lower-level teams, I think where you really see the disparity in talent is on the special teams. Clearly Alabama with McKinstry and Branch returning punts and Kool-Aid average 27 yards of punt return. They blocked a punt even though uh, Monroe had three personal protectors, uh, dominated the kicking game in this, in this game. And here's the thing too on these special teams. You talk about some of these teams. Uh, they can't afford to get the starters hurt. 
So there's even a greater disparity because you're talking about mostly backups probably on the special teams. Alabama uses a lot of their starters. On defense, it's the same for Will Anderson as it is for Bryce Young on offense. The expectations are way up here. He's played well. I thought this was his best game, not just because he had the pick six, but he was really disrupting their offense. He seemed dialed in and uh, seemed like the, uh, the uh, Will Anderson Jr. that we're accustomed to seeing. Yeah, he did. He played extremely well. You talk about the plays that he made. He had a great uh, tackle for a loss in the backfield, you know, kind of coming off that Texas game where I thought he finished that game really strong. People talk about the penalties. You know, maybe it wasn't his best game, but he had – I think he did get a hand on that, that – Field goal before half, but also certainly he finished strong with the sack. Bama 3-0. and We'll preview the Vanderbilt game coming up. Well, now it's time for Coach Talk. Crimson Tide head coach Nick Saban says that he thinks that the second-year head coach at Vanderbilt, Clark Lee, who played there, he understands the situation at Vanderbilt. It's a very high academic standard. It's a private institution, but he knows the culture. And Coach Saban feels like he's changing the mindset and the Vanderbilt football program is going in the right direction. I think culture is the biggest thing you try to establish in a program and they've got some pretty good players. They've got some experienced players that are back from a year ago. they got better skill guys than they normally have, better quarterbacks. Um, so you know, and they're doing a really, really good job of coaching them, and they've got really challenging systems to defend against. Rodney, I agree with Coach Saban. I, I think that this Vanderbilt football team is making progress under Clark Lee. Hey, listen, three and one is three and one. And when you're the coach at Vanderbilt, I don't care how you get there, to get to three and one is a major accomplishment for this program. Listen, they went on the road to Northern Illinois. They were an underdog in that game, Rod. Mm -hmm. And they won it 38 to 28. So I don't know what's going to happen as they get into conference play. I certainly expect them to lose on Saturday afternoon. But Clark Lee, as Coach Saban alluded to, is changing the culture. And this team plays with confidence, and they're together. Well, you look at statistically just the turnaround when you, you look at past Vanderbilt teams some of the statistics but you know they're averaging 42 points a game they're only giving up 28 I mean that's a big discrepancy Vanderbilt's 14 points better than their opponents so far that's yeah. pretty good they're really balanced on offense Gary I mean they're about 219 217 run pass uh, the quarterbacks are really efficient they've thrown 12 touchdown passes between the two quarterbacks only one interception Taking they're the averaging 5.8 yards per carry rushing the football so it's a really balanced team and uh, he's, he's certainly Clark Lee's done an outstanding job he is, and he says, listen, we understand what Alabama is all about. We know they're the second-rate team in the country. We know the standard of championships, but we're looking forward to going to Tuscaloosa and playing the Crimson Tide. Here's Clark Lee. We're going to learn a lot about ourselves on Saturday, you know, but I think we have a competitive team that, that, um, that has a belief in what we're building, and, and, um, and we know that ultimately this program – wants to measure up against the best in the country, the best in our conference. And so, um, yeah, we're, just, we're looking forward to it more than anything. All right, I'm going to bring you back in, Rod, for the final analysis on this game. Of course, we'll have our predictions coming up a little bit later on. All right, I understand the way the fan base is at Alabama, and I get it. Alabama's a 40-plus point favorite in this game. But this is an SEC game, okay? It counts the same as the other seven SEC games that Alabama's going to play. This is an SEC team. Coach Saban always talks about respect your opponent, but you really have to do it when you get into league play. And I think that you're going to see Alabama ratchet up a little bit this week and, and treat this opponent uh, for what it is, a conference game, your conference opener. Yeah, I mean, like you said, Gary, it, it is an SEC opener for both these teams. And, uh, you know, Vanderbilt comes in here, we talked about it. They're an improved football team. They should have Alabama's attention. But it's like Nick Saban always says, Gary, and you see this every week. It's a matter of this team, every player, every player that plays, uh, focusing on what it'll take to get better in this game. Because as Nick Saban said, I think it was yesterday, are you ready to prepare for the challenges of the future? And I think every time you have an opportunity to go out, develop, get better, uh, that certainly enhances your opportunities because they've got some great, I mean, great competition, great challenges coming up. All right, our score predictions on Alabama Vanderbilt coming up later in the show. Also coming up on Tider Insider Television, the University of Alabama is set to honor a player that has one of the most inspiring stories in college football history. He didn't play for the Crimson Tide. He played against Alabama in college, but he's a Bama man, or was a Bama man, to the core. And Alabama football scores big on the recruiting trail again. Tider Insiders Rodney Orr will break down the recent commitment of a Texas high school defensive lineman 
that could make an early impact when he arrives at the capstone. And also, we'll be getting your phone calls, emails, and tweets. As always, the phone number 205-348-WVUA. That's 348-9882. There's the email address. You can also tweet at us using the hashtag TITV. We'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide, Tider Insider Television. And welcome back to Tider Insider Television, presented by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Alongside Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. There will be an event at the Bryant Museum this Friday afternoon and evening to celebrate the life of Kent Waldrop. It'll be 4.30 to 8 p.m. The public is invited, a celebration of life for a man that uh, turned out to be very, very special to Alabama, and the University of Alabama was very special to him. He was an outstanding young running back for TCU in 1974. He had been recruited by schools all over the country, was a great baseball player as well. Alabama was playing TCU at Legion Field in Birmingham. Uh, he had a, I can remember the, the film of the, of the of the uh, injury, he took a sweep around the left side and uh, was hit uh, right in front of the Alabama sideline. He fell back on his head and he was immediately paralyzed and very fortunate to live. But uh, Coach Bryant and the Alabama football family adopted Kent as one of their own. Uh, TCU did not want to pay his medical bills and actually he went to court and won a settlement for them to pay but then on appeal he lost it. But Alabama uh, under the direction of Coach Bryant, continued to pay his medical bills. And even after Coach Bryant passed, uh, Kent and his family were taken care of. He had two sons that played sports here at the University of Alabama. And, uh, you know, in his uh, obituary in the Washington Post, he, you know, he let it be known that he, that he bled crimson. Uh, he's an honorary A-Club member. And um, this is a, and I remember it well. I was only 10 years old when it happened, but I remember the story. I know you do as well. And, and um, it's just a great story about a man who had his athletic career immediately end in a wheelchair, but he went on to have a credible life. President of the United States, George Bush, um, you know, let him name the Americans for Disability Act. Uh, there's a lot of things that you see now with adapted athletics and wheelchair athletics that happened because of Kent Walter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember it well. Obviously, it was 1974, as you said, Gary. It was, I was 14 years old listening to the game on the radio in Texas when it happened. There was obviously a big delay there. But, yeah, it is a tremendous story. You mentioned that about his two uh, sons coming to school here, attending to school, attending school here. I think they came on the Bryant Scholarship. Yeah, they did. Right? They yeah. did. Yeah. And I think one of them played baseball. I think they might have both played some sports here. But again, that's going to be Thursday or Friday evening, I should say, at the Bryant Museum. The public is welcome for a celebration of life for Kent Waldrop. All right, let's get to recruiting. And Alabama just keeps on rolling. This class is ranked number one in the country. And the latest commit came yesterday morning out of Tyler, Texas Legacy High School, highly recruited defensive lineman, Jordan Renault, six foot four, 245 pounds. Last season is a junior, 66 tack tackles, eight tackles for loss, two sacks. Uh, he's ranked number seven among defensive linemen and one of the top players in the state of Texas. Alabama now has 16 ESPN top 300 prospects in their class. And this is a guy, Rodney, that, uh, listen, you know, when you're going into the state of Texas, that East Texas hotbed of high school athletes, you're not only fighting the Texas schools, Oklahoma was the main competition for Alabama to go out there and receive this commitment. This is great for Freddie Roach and Holman Wiggins, his main recruiters, and great for Alabama. Yeah, I mean, Alabama's been in great position with him since probably early last spring. They did a tremendous job, as you mentioned there, Gary, recruiting him. Uh, you mentioned his, his size. He's a guy that's going to get bigger. But, you know, he goes back to what we've talked about many, many times here on this show, the way Alabama recruits, the culture they have here, the kind of players that they try to recruit. It's not just about the five stars. It's about are you a fit? And that's what Jen Jordan Renaud is. He's a great fit here. Tremendous kid, great leader, uh, guy that's a really good student, uh, well respected by everyone, very respectful person. If you saw his announcement yesterday, he did a tremendous job handling that. So he's a guy that, again, you talk about the Will Andersons, the Bryce Youngs, all of those guys, the full package. Jordan Renaud has the full package. All right, I'm very familiar with that East Texas area. My grandmother lived in Gladewater for years. I lived there for a while as a kid. Uh, Tyler, Longview, Kilgore, Gladewater, uh, they love high school football. And now the attention will turn to, Long, um, to uh, Longview wide receiver Jalen Hale, uh, who is set to make his announcement tomorrow. This is a tall, rangy wide receiver, and he's a guy that Alabama is pushing for hard. But it looks like Texas is going to be tough to beat here. Where does this stand? He'll, he'll announce tomorrow. Here, here's the thing, Gary. You know, when you follow this stuff, you really like to kind of talk to people on both sides. 
or and, and kind of get a feel for it. I think Alabama's extremely confident from the things I've picked up uh, about their chances, or they were at least heading into today from things I had uh, learned. But I would say this, too, talking to other people, Texas feels really, really good. They're aware that Alabama's confident, but Texas is still confident that they will end up with Jalen Hale. So, again, difficult to predict, but, uh, you know, it's hard to go against the home state school, especially when Sark's doing a really yeah. good job right now. He is. We'll find out tomorrow. Well, Alabama soccer is hot. I mean, probably hotter than it's ever been in the history of the program. Alabama is just on a roll. Uh, they beat Number five, South Carolina shut them out two to nothing. It was their third win over a ranked team this season. Then on Sunday evening, they blew out Chattanooga six to zip as six different players netted goals. Alabama now heads to Knoxville on Thursday to fight face Tennessee in its SEC road opener. And uh, Alabama and the Vols are set to kick it off at 5 p.m. Central Time. This Alabama soccer team, they're doing some special things right now. Well, still to come on TITV, Alabama Volleyball takes on a ranked SEC opponent this week. And up next, we'll be welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. You see the phone number information on your screen, 205-348-9882. Go ahead and give us a call. Get online now so we can talk to you when this edition of TITV continues after this. Alabama Volleyball opens its SEC schedule tomorrow evening at 12th-ranked Florida. It'll be tough. The Gators will be the first-ranked opponent for the Crimson Tide this season. Alabama goes into the game with a 6-6 six six record after going 1-2 at last week's Horned Frog Invitational out in Texas. Wednesday's match in Gainesville marks the end of a 10-match road streak for the Tide. They've been on the road a lot. They'll return home this weekend for the first time since week one to face in-state rival Auburn both Saturday and Sunday at Foster Auditorium. And welcome back into the program with Rodney Orr. I'm Gary Harris. It's time to take some phone calls, and we're going to start it off with Johnny over in Bessemer. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Gary. What's going on, brother? Hey, man. What's going on, brother? Hey, hey man. I'm, I'm trying to find out, man. You know, Alabama's doing real good in recruiting, man. Do, do, do y'all think we've got a good chance winning all this year? Later on, buddy. All right, John. Yeah, I, I do. I think Alabama's one of the teams uh, – not only to win, uh, to have a chance to win the recruiting championship, but to win the, the championship on the field, too. A lot of work to do in both areas, but, uh, hey, that's the standard here, Rod. And, and I know John calls is a regular caller. He asks us that, it seems like, every year. Do you think we have a chance to win the national championship? And I always have the same answer. Yeah, got a chance just about every year. Absolutely, yep. All right, let's keep it rolling. Gary down in Malville is up next. Hey, Gary, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I got a, one question here. I'm on three, uh, I got three names here for 2023. Recruiting cycle, Keon Keeley, James Smith, or Quile Rasaw. Mm. What are their chances coming in? All right, thank you, Gary. I'll let Ronnie handle those. We'll start with Keon Keeley, the Notre Dame decommit, who is uh, now looking around. Certainly, Alabama's high on his list. Yep, uh, Alabama certainly, as Gary said, very high on his list. Ohio State's in there. Florida's uh, very much in the picture as well. Uh, yeah, we'll see. He's supposed to be here, I think, for the Texas A&M game. He may take an unofficial visit to Ohio State this weekend. I think they play Wisconsin. But, um, you know, so still in the mix, yeah, I think Alabama's probably, if, if you made me guess right now, I'd say maybe the leader. As far as Quay Russo and James Smith, two kids from Montgomery Carver, both those guys five-star rated players. You look at James Smith, tremendous defensive line prospect, maybe the best interior defensive lineman in the country, perhaps. Uh, Quay Russo is a, a tremendous linebacker prospect. I just think they're unpredictable. I think Auburn's still in the mix, even though they're having issues down there. Alabama, Georgia, you know, Miami's been in there, Florida, various ones. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But, again, I, I just think those two right now, if I had to – Kind of make a guess, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> All right, and we'll be back with more phone calls after this on TITV. And welcome back into TITV. It's time for our email question of the day. The email question of the day is brought to you by KDM Service Corporation, serving your family like our family. All right, let's show it to you. It's from Jim in Nevada. Is the Alabama Adaptive Sports Program a part of the Athletics Department? I don't see a lot of coverage on it. It is not a part of the Athletics Department at the University of Alabama. It is one of the best uh, wheelchair athletic departments in the country, but it, separate, it operates separately from the uh, athletics department. But it gets a lot of coverage, Jim, compared to what most schools get. I know we cover them regularly. It's a national championship caliber program. And as I said, one of the best in the country, but not part of the UA athletics department. All right, starting to squeeze in a quick phone call with Reg over in Birmingham. Reg, we got about a minute. Go ahead, man. Hey, guys. I keep wondering when we're going to get the uh, everything in, in its place. I ask you and Rodney this every week. Why is the, it take us so long to get our offensive line together? All those five-star 
players. I look forward to this Tennessee game. We better start looking, waking up before we get to Ole Miss and Tennessee. I'm yeah, Reg. Hey, listen. It's it again. Sometimes when you have new players, you have a new left tackle. You have a young fre uh, sophomore at right tackle who played some last year as a true freshman. Uh, you know, so I think sometimes you, with a new coach, uh, you know, you continue to evaluate who are your best five, and I think that's part of what they've done. And it looks like to me, based on the second half, Gary, they're finding some guys that they feel like they're comfortable that moving forward they can make a lot of progress and develop into a really good offensive line. All right, thanks for the phone calls and the email. It's prediction time for Alabama and Vanderbilt when we come back on a beautiful evening here on the University of Alabama campus. Stay with us. New Orleans Saints running back Mark Ingram at the University of Alabama rushed for 60 yards to go over 10,000 yards from scrimmage in his career on Sunday for the Saints against the Bucks. Now, listen to this. You go over 10,000 career yards from scrimmage, non-quarterbacks, of course. He's only the 108th player in NFL history to reach the milestone and just the third player from Alabama to do it. Rodney, do you know the other two? No, I don't. Julio and uh, Sean Alexander. Oh, wow. So how about that? Awesome for Mark Ingram. A pro's pro. You know what I mean? Just a consistent, just like he was here at Alabama. He's been a terrific pro. All right, Rodney, prediction time. You lead us off against Vanderbilt. Well, you know, I look at this game, Gary. You really want to see Alabama come out, play really well, crisp in the, the SEC opener. Offensively, we're talking about the offensive line continue to develop, make some progress there, uh, develop that chemistry between Bryce and these receivers, continue that, see the running game get going, developing an identity. Defensively, you're really going up against a, a Vanderbilt offense averaging 42 points a game. They've been very balanced. Create some turnovers, stuff the run, win big. 49-17. All right, Rod, I was really surprised that this line is over 40 points. I've seen it as high as 43, as low as 41. Uh, I do think that's the only question. Does Alabama cover the point spread? I really like what Clark Lee's doing at Vanderbilt. I think Alabama wins. I don't think they cover the spread. I got Bama winning by 38, 48 to 10 on Saturday night at Bryant-Denny Stadium. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Tider Insider TV presented by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget, if you missed any of tonight's show, you can catch the replay tonight at 1030 after the news at 10 or online anytime at WVUA23.com. For Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody.